Coming up, the boom and bust cycle of Kuskokwim Kings. Last year, their numbers had improved, but this year, test fisheries show the run appears to be headed for a record low. It's a very difficult decision to make, um, to have to tell anybody that they can't go out and get their food. Food for both body and soul. It is the, the gift of our creator. Ahead, how the ups and downs of the King Run have an entire region on an emotional roller coaster. Sponsorship for Frontiers with Rhonda McBride is provided by your local Alaska Toyota dealers. Toyota, let's go places. Alaska, where there are old triumphs, but also new frontiers. With challenges as great as the state itself, but a belief the best is yet to come. Bringing you the faces, the places, and the spirit of the last frontier. This is Frontiers with Rhonda McBride. Welcome to Frontiers. In this program, we look at one of the big mysteries on the Kuskokwim River in southwest Alaska. What has happened to the king salmon that used to feed families up and down this 700-mile stretch of river? In most years, the smokehouses would be full by now, but some wonder if those days will ever return. Once there was a rhythm to the seasons, as sure as the tides. When the tundra cotton bloomed, and the sweet smell of alder smoke drifted by, along with a sense of pride and purpose. We feel it in, in our body. We can't stay still. It feels great to cut fish, king salmon. That's how Catherine Amick describes the primal urge to cut fish. In the normal order of things, there's no rest until the fish racks are heavy with kings and moved into smokehouses, safe from July's wave of flies, rain, and mold. They're beautiful, you know. They're wonderful to see. It's happiness. That was last year when the King Run recovered enough to allow limited fishing. The test fishery showed an improvement over 2013's record low, but this season, the numbers dropped again and could turn out to be the lowest ever. It's a very difficult decision to make, um, to have to tell anybody that they can't go out and get their food. And with strict conservation measures in place, fish camps this year looked a lot like these ghostly scenes a few years ago. The hope? that these sacrifices would allow enough fish to swim to their spawning grounds to restore the run to its traditional strength. It's the largest subsistence king salmon fishery in the state, likely the world. The Department of Fish and Game is at a loss to explain why the run has failed yet again after signs of a slow but steady recovery. The entire ocean, the entire Bering Sea is a black box. Scientists have only begun to understand all the variables during the fish's five to seven year journey out in the ocean. What is it that we can do to make the big black box more knowable? There are so many different factors and the complexity of all those factors over the duration of their life cycle. It's very difficult to highlight a smoking gun, so to speak, or one specific connection. And every year, there are pieces of the puzzle that don't fit. The Yukon has suffered through king salmon runs that were just as weak, if not weaker, than those on the Kuskokwim. And yet this year, king numbers on the Yukon are on the rebound. Both Yukon and Kuskokwim, there's not really any major um, events that you can point to over the last couple of years in the freshwater conditions that would, at least something that's so significantly different between the Kuskokwim and the Yukon that might help to explain that. True to its name in Yupik, Kuskokwim means big, slow, muddy thing. And for those who depend on the salmon to feed their families, there is no clarity, only frustration and fear. 
Biologists hope the Kuskokwim run is simply late, that another pulse of kings are on their way. But every day their numbers taper off. And the Kuskokwim isn't the only river headed for record lows. Southeast Alaska has seen record low numbers of kings on the Stikeen and Taku rivers. Neither river is expected to see enough fish to meet escapement goals. Kings from these two rivers make up about 80% of the wild king run in Southeast Alaska. Hatchery kings there are also down as well. Up next, what does the loss of a harvest mean? When it comes to subsistence, there's a lot more to it than meets the eye. Our guests have some insight on that. Lamont Albertson, a member of a fisherman's working group, and Katie Howard, a fisheries researcher. They have some theories about what's causing the kings to crash. Toyota presents the sensations of summer. The perfect cars, trucks, and SUVs to get you to your favorite destinations. Like the all-time best-selling sedan in the world, Corolla. Recently named as an IIHS top safety pick. Every new Corolla now features Toyota Safety Sense as standard equipment. Add in Toyota Care, Toyota's no-cost maintenance plan, along with these great limited-time offers, and you'll see why we call it sensational. Come drive a Corolla for yourself at your Alaska Toyota dealer. Or shop online anytime. Toyota, let's go places. If you're talking, they will hear you every single time. Why are we getting killed like this? Kyle's not here. Got caught drinking beer in the park a couple of nights ago. Really? Yeah. Zero tolerance. He's out for the season. Harsh. Hey, he knew not to drink. We've made that clear to all of our kids, right? Uh, no, not really. Bill, if we don't tell them what we expect and why they shouldn't drink, how are they going to know? Talk. They hear you. For more information, visit underagedrinking.samsa.gov. You try Our scholars. We are teachers. We are many things, but tobacco does not define us. It's a fact. Over half of Alaska Native adults don't use tobacco. For more resources on building a healthy life, visit antc.org slash we are. It's always so much love here. The best part of my job that I get to help people it just makes me happy to make other people happy. I have never used Tinder, but I imagine that's what it feels like to get a right swipe. Because that's what you do when you see someone in need. You help them. I swear I mean... You're an American hero. <laughs> 4 p.m. right before first take at 5. Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook fame was in Alaska recently, and he shared some of his Alaska pictures on Facebook. These were taken on his trip to Homer and highlighted the importance of subsistence, which he called a social safety net. He said usually there's a stigma for taking part in a social safety net program, but he said, quote, here, everyone we met was proud of this, both for its cultural heritage and for individual accomplishment in catching and preparing their salmon. Interesting comments from someone outside of Alaska. Well, joining us now, two guests who have been involved in protecting subsistence, Lamont Albertson, a longtime member of the Kuskokwim River Salmon Management Working Group, and Katie Howard, who is a research biologist for the Department of Fish and Game, and some of her research has bearing on the Yukon and other parts of the state. So we'll talk about that. But first of all, Katie, what's your reaction to Zuckerberg's comments about subsistence? Well, obviously subsistence, especially in rural parts of Alaska, is, is important. Um, there are a lot of places where there aren't grocery stores or the, um, the availability of food is, is really expensive and so in Kuskokwim and Yukon rivers, for instance, Chinook salmon uh, subsistence accounts for 90% or more of the subsistence harvest for the entire state. And Lamont, of course, you've lived in Antioch, where, where you know well the, the grocery prices. You know, it's interesting that Zuckerberg kind of recognizes the importance of subsistence as an outsider. But I think in Alaska, there's a little bit of a disconnect from the urban and rural areas about how important this resource is. Well, I think there is. <clears throat> if you go to any celebration out of Antioch, whether it's a Slavic celebration, the Russian Orthodox observance of Christmas, or it's a celebration of life, or... Uh, 
uh, a wedding or anything like that. Fish will make up the, the bulk of the food that we will be eating at those sort of celebrations. And with that in mind, you know, people absolutely depend upon fish for their substantive parts of their diets. They can go into the stores and buy different sorts of foods if they want to, but fish, fish is what they So, on. you know, we have so, a, a look at some of the fish camps from last summer, and of course people were very happy because the King Run had rebounded. It looked like it was tracking, and now it swung the other way. So how are people reacting to this? I think people are adjusting very well. We certainly had a different uh, migratory pattern this year in our kings and fish coming back and fishermen are fishermen. They've sought those fish out and they've caught them in different places in the near shore of the Bering Sea, for example, like we haven't caught them before, but people are adjusting accordingly. Well, you know, the last time that they crashed and that was a record low, now this looks like a record low. People were very panicked. How are they coping? Well, I think that was 2013, and I think through the years we've been preparing ourselves for the fact that we just don't have the number of kings coming back, not just locally, but statewide. Now, you've been a longtime member of the, the working group. Correct. And it's kind of a unique body. It, it, you know, it doesn't exist in other fisheries throughout the state, but I've known these meetings to be extremely volatile, people screaming and yelling when there are shortages. What's the tone in this year's meetings? Well, I think we've had several years, again, to adjust to these downturns, and I think the tone is positive this year. We recognize that we've got to protect the resource at the same time that we're protecting the social needs of our folks on the Kuskokwim. But what are people saying at these meetings this year? Some people are saying we should be conserving kings more, that we just should not be catching kings, and some people are saying we should allow us a lower harvest of kings, and people are saying we should start depending more upon our silver salmon, our red salmon, our chum salmon, and start adjusting accordingly. Now there's a new body that is formed, and you were uh, initially head of it in its launch phase, the Intertribal Fisheries Commission, and now uh, Mary Peltola is, is head of that commission. You know, what is, is this body doing? Well, we're looking at basically the same things, but it's all 33 tribes are represented in the Cusquam River Intertribal Fish Commission. And we have a, a PhD micro, uh, uh, biologist working for us who used to work for the Department of Fish and Game. We also have Dr. Jim Simon, who is a uh, subsistence person out of Fairbanks, retired U.S. Fish and uh, So that helps to have that expertise. Yeah, so we've, we've got people advising us, you know, and it allows us to ask the right questions and to come up with the right schemes for managing these years where we have downturns in numbers. Well, one of the ironies is, is that the Yukon River uh, has seen an uptick, and normally they, they track with the Kuskokwim uh, in these crashes, and, and which have been in some ways worse. Katie, can you tell us about some of your research out there and, and what you're finding? Well, uh, so we've been doing research in the northern Bering Sea, which is where the Yukon fish first enter the ocean, and, and we've been measuring the number of juveniles and how healthy they are uh, in the northern Bering Sea. And what we've seen is we did expect uh, this uptick for 2017 for the Yukon because we saw a lot of healthy juveniles uh, in previous years that would lead up to this. Now what, what we're trying to understand is why the Northern Bering Sea may be doing something different than the Southern Bering Sea where Kuskokwim and Bristol Bay Chinook salmon are first entering the ocean. So what are you seeing? You know, would you have any theories about why one area did better than another? Because they're so close. Yeah, so we're working with colleagues at NOAA and pursuing this idea that sea ice cover may be important to uh, the, the entire habitat of the Southern Bering Sea versus the Northern Bering Sea. So in the northern Bering Sea, year after year, we have sea ice cover throughout the winter. But that's much ver more variable in the southern Bering Sea, where in some years you have warmer winters, you don't have the sea ice cover that you normally would. And so the idea is that Kuskokwim Chinook, for instance, might have um, more variable survival from year to year. They might have bigger ups and downs year to year. So sea ice, it, it seems mm -hmm. to be one of the key pieces of the puzzle and you know we're told that it's shrinking. <laughs> right, and, and, and that, is, that is the concern um, when you have the Bering Sea, for instance, where so much of the habitat is, is 
covered in ice uh, throughout the winter, what happens when that changes? Now we have seen though uh, areas that aren't affected by sea ice like southeast, you know, they have had the record lows projected, but on the other hand, uh, you know, we have other parts of the state that seem to be doing better. Uh, so how, do, how does this work? <laughs> what does this tell you? Well, I think, you know, we saw this decline, you know, pretty much across the state um, for a number of years. And, and I, I don't think even though we have seen some improvement in some stocks uh, in some years, it, it hasn't really bounced back to the levels that we've seen in, say, the 1980s. And so uh, it, I think uh, we're still in sort of an overall downward trend, um, but there is, you know, some improvement in some areas. So I guess it all comes down to the big question. Is this climate change? Lamont, what do you think? Well, I definitely think it's climate change. Anybody who's lived out there, since I've been out there since late 60s, has seen a lot of change. And we've seen change. We have a burgeoning population of pike on the Cusquim River, which we have not had before, and they're a tremendous predator for, for salmon smolt. And there's just a lot of change. Really. There are berries ripening at a different time. The fish are coming back at different times. There's definitely some changes taking place, and long-term implications of that are yet to be known. Is it looking more like climate change is, is one of the major factors driving these ups and downs in, in the fisheries? Well, it's, it's hard to say, um, because when you talk about climate change, it's, it's so complex. You're talking about temperatures, you're talking about, you know, in interior Alaska, there are concerns about permafrost melting and how that might affect uh, spawning and rearing habitats. You're talking about changes to the entire ecosystem in the ocean that we don't really have a, a firm grasp on how that's going to affect uh, salmon. Uh, we just know that there will be changes. And I guess, you know, all you can do is look at what's going on now and, and how important resources are that are struggling. And we put together some numbers from a Department of Fish and Game survey in 2014 for the amount of subsistence foods per pound uh, consumed by an individual, 15 for Anchorage. Uh, in Western Alaska, 370 pounds a year per person. Lamont, you know, what do, you, what do these numbers tell you and, and how can we understand better how important subsistence is? Well, you just have to think of what would happen to you if you here, lived here in Anchorage and you couldn't get to a grocery store. You know, that's how important these subsistence foods you just have to do without if you don't get the subsistence foods. Now we have another graphic that shows you the value of that economically, if you could put a price tag on it. Uh, but for Western Alaska, 36 million. Do you believe that number? Is that out of bounds? I absolutely believe that. If you think about the cost of groceries out there and you think about the cost of our fish and our ease and getting our fish, not necessarily the ease or work involved, but the fact that we have those resources available to us. I have no question about that. And I think some people would be surprised at how much fish is consumed as part of that poundage. And if you look at it, at this graphic, it looks like about half of what people eat in Western Alaska in particular is fish. Absolutely right. You don't get hummus and crackers when you go to a social out there. You get strips and you get good fish from the summertime. You know, absolutely right. We depend upon that food for all of our social occasions as well as our sustenance. You know, we've got such a debate about climate change. People who say that, you know, this is really not something, you know, that we should be looking at, that it's a passing natural thing. But what are the policy implications out here you know, well, for what's going on? We know that when the gravel temperatures reach a certain temperature that those salmon are just not going to thrive anymore. We know that there are optimal temperatures for salmon smolt to develop in up in our streams and stuff. We know that there's absolutely temperature needs for those salmon to continue to come back and some of we're bumping right against those temperatures right now in terms of the viability of our salmon population, particularly on the Andrevsky River and on the Yukon. So Katie, quickly, what, what are the policy implications for fish and game and other organizations? Well, one of the concerns we have is, is just for getting the support um, in terms of funding and resources. We, we rely a lot on our partnerships with uh, NOAA and with universities, um, as well as funding from grant organizations. And so if there isn't the interest in supporting 
this kind of research that impacts fisheries and impacts people, then then it's, it's harder to do the work that needs to be done. All right, well, thank you very much for being here to give us some insight into it. Well, up next, we will take you to Kodiak for a tour of a fish plant. I'm Lainey Welch. Coming up, why Kodiak is one of the biggest and busiest fishing ports in the nation. Also, meet one of the newest visitors to Alaska, one of those new mysteries out in that big black box we call the ocean. I just want cremation. No hidden costs, no add-ons. Cremation is much more affordable. Dignified, ecological. I just want something basic. The simpler, the better. Cremation sure makes a lot of sense. The Cremation Society of Alaska is now serving families in Anchorage and in the Valley. And we are always on the web at alaskacremation.com. Call us today at 277-2777 or in the Valley, 373-8627. In Washington, D.C. I shot that man! All cylinders, people, let's go! Whatever crime you're guilty of. We need ammunition, big, small, anything you can find. Dig deep and dig fast. Whatever sin you've committed. You let that girl get into his pants! Olivia Pope can fix it. Whatever happens, there's always another move. I do not give up. Heat up your weekends with a little scandal. got caught in an addiction and I couldn't find my way out of that cardboard box. It kept grasping onto me. Before I realized it, I couldn't stop using it. It becomes like a primal instinct. It's god awful. There's no relief and it's always there. They needed a program that would really save my life and I found Narconon. Narconon gave me my life back 100%. What is health? It's more than a number on the scale. It's in the water we drink and the air we breathe. It's reflected in our jobs, our climate, and our community. Our health is holistic. Our health care should be the same. At ANTHC, we're providing clean water and sanitation around the state. We're working in partnership to make homes safer, health care treatment smarter, and fulfill our vision that Alaska Native people are the healthiest people in the world. Often one fishery is pitted against another, and that's been the case with the pollock industry, which catches salmon and other species in their nets accidentally. Fishing fleets have worked hard to reduce what's called bycatch, and for communities like Kodiak, pollock is one of the pillars of the economy. Alaska Fish Radio's Lainey Welch shows us why. Many people are surprised to know that Alaska's fisheries start on January 1st and run throughout the year and nowhere will you see that better than in Kodiak. This town runs on fish. You'll see that when we go across the channel to one of our big fish processing plants. The forklifts here are always on the move. The Topaz has worked for North Pacific probably for 25 years. Oh my goodness. Matt Moyer, the general manager of Alaska Pacific Seafoods, says you'll find boats like the Topaz here year round. So familiar, even the sea lions feel at home. They're cute, but they can do a world of hurt. And so people really need to be mindful of that, and give them lots of space. Right now, the boats are offloading Pollock. Their numbers are at a 20-year high. We went five and a half weeks straight with a half a day off in that time span. That was in January. Steady year-round work from Pollock has helped workers buy homes and put down roots in Kodiak. And it's great for the workers because they make a lot of money working seven days a week and it's great for the town. This boat has landed about 300,000 pounds of Pollock taken in an eight-hour trip. Since the 1980s, Pollock has added to Kodiak's portfolio of salmon, halibut, cod, and others, and helped weather the ups and downs inherent in all fisheries. Some things are going to be down, some things are going to be up, but uh, in combination, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good, good resource and it's, and it's a good place to be in the fishery right now. These 
fish are headed to buyers from all over the world and are subject to a wide range of regulations. Every single fish is accounted for from the moment it's caught. If we have a buyer come to us five months from now and he says, well, we think we got a problem with this lot of fish, we can track that right back to the vessel. Today, much of the seafood processing industry is automated, which has helped to ease labor shortages. But running all the computers and specialized machinery requires increasingly sophisticated skills, and those jobs are hard to fill. Is Alaska rising to the challenge in terms of training a workforce? It's going to be a big challenge for the industry, and, and I think with that challenge, there's a lot of opportunity. Opportunities that are likely to be there in the future. We live in the epicenter of the, some of the best seafood in the world. Demand for Alaska Pollock continues to grow in Asia, Europe, and the U.S. Customers want more fish sticks, surimi blends, and prepackaged portions. Speed is of the essence here. So this fish was caught yesterday. Um, it was unloaded uh, early this morning. And frozen and shipped by the evening. But before then, the pollock must be sorted and passed through an array of conveyor belts, what seems like a Rube Goldberg contraption. Every step, such as glazing before freezing, is designed to maximize and preserve the freshness of the fish. This batch of pollock is headed to China and Korea. Here it is going in the bag, stitched up, and there it goes in the pallet. It's already got a uh, label on it. Moyer says traceability and accountability are top priorities, as well as earth-friendly practices. The company points to windmills that help to provide nearly 100% of Kodiak's clean electric energy and power its fish plants. Pollock is Alaska's largest fishery with catches often topping 3 billion pounds a year. So the next time you bite into a fish sandwich at your favorite fast food restaurant or serve up a batch of fish sticks to the kids, you're probably enjoying Alaska Pollock maybe from right here in Kodiak. For Frontiers, I'm Lainey Welch. So much of Alaska's livelihood depends on what happens out in the water. And there are a growing number of signs that our ocean is changing. Scientists have been puzzled by the appearance of these strange sea creatures known as pyrosomes. Typically, they colonize in tropical waters, but they turned up in fishing nets near Sitka. Now, they've been working their way north, but researchers say this is their first documented appearance in Alaska. And that'll do it for this edition of Frontiers. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week.